third and final session of Joining Forces with the Indo-Pacific, Kickstarting Europe's New Approach to the Region. This session is on the green transition, cooperation and systemic competition. Um, and I think that um, I would like to just kind of say a few brief uh, housekeeping remarks and then a few um, kind of framing words. This uh, conversation um, is organized by the European Council on Foreign Relations in cooperation with the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. And it's coming to you from four different time zones, from five different cities. And because it's digital, it has a much better uh, carbon footprint than it would have had if we actually met in person. So I guess we're making a virtue out of the necessity of this, uh, unfortunately, still um, not so fantastic situation of the pandemic and that we can't fly all of you in, bring all of you together in person, which we will hopefully be able to do at a later point next year. Um, we hope uh, that we can provide you with new insights and ideas and to move the um, debate that we're having on this issue forward a little bit. As in the other sessions previously, we will bring you in with your questions and comments um, and be, you can use the raise hand function or the chat function for that. The fight against climate change is often portrayed as, as the one issue with such a devastating consequences that the world will have to overcome bickering between nation states and work together. It's kind of global character makes it, in official rhetoric at least, an indisputable field of cooperation with China and other major carbon producers. But undoubtedly, we are far away from climate change being what has been called the happy place of cooperation. In reality, climate action increasingly intersects with questions of geopolitical uh, and geoeconomic interest. Um, there's competition for technologies, markets, resources, and broader geopolitical influence. And all of that has become relatively inseparable from the green transition agenda. So in our fantastic panel, we want to ask, how will the post-COP climate action, the push for leadership in green industries, navigating dependencies on critical materials, and the growing emphasis on the green transition in connectivity plans, fit together into a coherent European approach to the Indo-Pacific and what are the expectations in the region. For this, I have a stellar lineup um, and panel with me. Um, we are bringing to you um, Paolo Cariri, um, who's responsible for China relations in the Directorate General for Climate Action at the European Commission. Um, he was the head of the trade and economic section at the EU delegation to Mexico before, the head of the trade section at the delegation of the EU to the Republic of Korea. <clears throat> where he implemented also the EU Korea FTA, a policy coordinator in international climate negotiations at DG Klima, and a first secretary in the trade section at the delegation of the EU to Japan. So he does bring a lot of regional expertise to the table as well. We also have Olivia Lazard, who's a visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe. Her research focuses on the geopolitics of climate, the transition measured by climate change, and the risks of conflict and fragility associated to climate change and environmental collapse. Her research, particularly at the field level and on thematic issues, has led to support the European External Action Service in integrating environmental peacekeeping as part of their mediation toolkit. Prior to joining Carnegie Europe, Olivia set up her own consultancy firm, which remains exclusively active in conflict and fragile zones. We are very proud to have with us Mihir Sharma, who's the director of the Center for Economy and Growth Program um, at the Observer Research Foundation. Um, and he was trained as an economist and political scientist in Delhi and in Boston, but um, he's most known to most of you um, as the India columnist for Bloomberg Opinion. Um, on the, he's also on the editorial board of the Business Standard newspaper in New Delhi, an Aspen Fellow and a columnist for the Indian Express, so a much read person also here in Europe. And last but certainly not least, um, with Byford Sang, my co-conspirator um, on climate publications in the past. He's a senior policy advisor on, our, um, on climate diplomacy at E3G. Um, he's uh, leading the China strategy and engagement team. Before joining E3G, he worked in sustainable finance and at the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. He spent three years in Hong Kong as an environmental consultant, working with actors in the manufacturing sector in mainland China and Southeast Asia to develop corporate sustainability policies. So uh, I don't think I'm, uh, I'm underselling this when I'm saying we have an amazing group of people brought together um, to give us a wide array um, of this kind of complex topic. And each of them will start out with a few minutes of introductory remarks, and we will then go into questions and answers. We will start with Polo. Polo, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you for inviting me. And indeed, with such uh, good fellow panelists. Um, 
Well, it's, uh, I think from my side, being the least academic profile among the speaker, I will speak more as a practitioner and say a little bit what we are, well, in the European Commission, what we are preparing and doing basically when it comes to cooperation uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And of course, since in the title of the systemic competition as well, uh, I suppose I should speak about China a little bit as well. Um, well, first in very general terms, of course, the increase in new ambition, uh, European D, climate law, fit for 55 packages, uh, will change quite dramatically. Um, not only, of course, the, the emission profile of the EU, but the economy of the EU, uh, the, in particular through the carbonization, of course, of the economy. Now, this is will not only limited by us, it's quite clear. I mean, we saw it in Glasgow as insufficient as actual pledges are, there is a trend going in the direction that all major emitters will embark into, into low carbon economy and decarbonization uh, in the next few decades. So uh, uh, maybe I'm over optimistic, but I really think that moving away from fossil fuels is a one way road and we embark the road, the road is still long and, and bumpy, but, but we are going into that direction and I think there is no way back. Now, the impact on the economy, it's multifaceted, and that probably can be a conference. But obviously, well, demand for fossil fuel will go down. That's quite obvious. Uh, demand for renewable will increase, of course. Uh, environmental standards will play a crucial role also in industrial policies um, all over the world. And I like to believe in Europe, we are still ahead of, of the others in that terms. But there are many other elements which will play. Of course, dissemination of technologies is crucial. And I think in Indo-Pacific in particular, it is crucial because we have all kinds of countries there from countries where we are a bit more concerned about doing too much technology transfer. And obviously China is, is on top of, of a pile there, uh, but also uh, many countries where we, we know we should do technology transfer to help them transition in a better way. Um, and of course, there is the issue of new materials, which we, need, we will need critical material, which we we'll need more and more. So redesign of value chain and competition for rare material is going to be a very tough uh, fight, I think, in the future, as tough as it has been, I think, access to fossil fuels in the past, well, and still today. Now, uh, Having said that, uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, we are working very closely with a number of countries. We have dialogue, uh, high-level dialogue on, on climate with, with China, with India, with ASEAN, with Korea, with Japan. So there is a number of this kind of structured dialogues which are existing already. Uh, China obviously is very important uh, because it's the biggest emitter, because uh, uh, it's well, globally, not only in the region. Um, and it's also a country where who can really create new trends really. So it is important. Of course, uh, in the introduction, it was very nicely said that is theoretically could be very rosy and we can cooperate with everybody. Uh, obviously it's not always easy. Uh, what we are trying to do really is, I think it's a bit different from China and the rest of the region. In, as I said, with China, we are more in a dialogue mode. We have a lot of cooperation in particular in emission trading since they are uh, one of the, of the country moved quicker into emission trading, well, after us, obviously, but so there is a lot of potential there. With other countries, what we are trying to do is establish a network of green alliances and green partnership. Now, green alliance being uh, the most ambitious levels with countries which we believe are at the same level as us, more or less, in terms of ambition, and Japan is the first country with whom we are, we are studying. And this is really a deeper integration, let's say, of policy integration and cooperation. With other countries, we are planning to do more partnerships. Korea is a possibility, Bangladesh is another one, Vietnam is another one. All this is, is basically being designed now, but the idea is also there to try and create as many alliances as, as we want. And then, and I will conclude with this, we are also trying to have a regional dimension because that's also very important. I mean, it's important to work with all these countries separately, but it's also important to try and have something which puts all this together. And for instance, uh, for many years, we have a global covenant of major uh, in Europe. There is an Asian version of it, which is supported obviously by us very, very much. Or originally it was very much Japan who embarked into that, but we are very happy that recently 
China also uh, joined, joined, joined the club and the mayor of Wuhan has been nominated the, the, the Chinese delegate for a covenant of mayor. So I think this is quite nice because at local level to create an opportunity within the region to cooperate, uh, probably uh, overcoming at least some of the political difficulties which exist when you try to cooperate uh, at, at state level. So I didn't check exactly my time, but it should not be far from seven minutes, I believe. So I would rather stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Polo. And it was also that is probably the idea. Um, I would like to hand the floor over immediately to Olivia, and we'll get back to comments and questions to you after all of the statements. Olivia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yanka. Thank you to ECFR and for the Kedor set to invite me on this panel. Um, I'm uh, really honored to be there. I will come at this at the topic from a thematic perspective. Um, and obviously, I suppose that you've been talking about um, the importance of the Indo-Pacific region um, all day. Um, and we don't need to, um, you know, go back into why the, the, the this particular region is important, but I'd like to highlight um, three particular themes and, uh, and segues into how the EU needs to approach, um, you know, uh, strategically the region um, and where, you know, some potential pathways for cooperation are. I'd like to start essentially from COP26 um, because I believe that something quite major happened during the second week of COP26. For a long time, obviously, COPs have been focused on mitigation issues um, and those will remain at the top of the agenda. But there is something different about the way in which we need to approach the, ne the next decade of climate diplomacy. One is that we've entered the decade of implementation. So it is about how the EU will demonstrate indeed, as Paolo was saying, how the EU can transition fast, effectively and coherently. But beyond that, there's also the part, the part where COP26 essentially changed focus in terms of um, very much highlighting the importance of adaptation particularly. The topic was first addressed from a climate finance perspective and particularly regarding the shortfalls of uh, the climate finance um, issue, but there was a lot less conversation happening around what adaptation looks like in a climate disrupted world, especially you know, as we sort of look into different scenarios according to different levels of warming. And yet um, we know essentially that there's a huge demand from Indo-Pacific states and from climate vulnerable states around the world um, for what exactly adaptation looks like, how, so how much support can go into research, into cooperation to try and figure it out and how it translates essentially into climate finance and investments for the region. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, it connects very much to a conversation that really needs to take place in the Indo-Pacific region. At the moment, a lot of donors, particularly the US, have focused so much on the geopolitical dimension of the Indo-Pacific region that um, the needs of Indo-Pacific states regarding climate adaptation and climate mitigation have essentially sort of, you know, taken um, a back seat, whereas for them, it is actually one of the most important, if not the most important um, conversation that needs to happen. So states in the, in the Indo-Pacific are still waiting to, to receive support, which is not a form of instrumentalization in the geopolitical race with China, but which really responds to their needs with a value proposition. And the important thing to understand as a result of COP26 is that as much as the EU still focuses its climate diplomacy on raising ambitions and raising mitigation planning, Mitigation ambitions now very much depend on the adaptation conversation, both in terms of finance, but also in terms of the quality of supports that they receive. So this is a key way for European actors to exercise geopolitical agency, a third way of geopolitical agency through climate diplomacy going forward. And this is particularly important in the next two years. Now, the second aspect that I'd like to focus on, which obviously re relates to the first, is that and in order to do that, I'm just going to show very quickly a slide. 
Uh, this is a slide that uh, comes from a Nature article that was uh, published a year and a half ago, which highlights the global regeneration priority areas. These are the areas where we need to focus a lot of attention in terms of ecosystems protection on the one hand from legal, economic and social perspectives, but also how to undertake complex regeneration programming and investments. And as you can see, the Indo-Pacific region stands out as one of the reddest areas on the planet. Um, and there needs to be a lot of uh, investments, research, um, and programming that needs to go into what does complex regeneration look like in this particular in, in, in this particular region of the world, knowing that complex regeneration actually combines mitigation and adaptation targets together. It is an integrated approach towards um, climate action. But not only that, it also provides a lot of um, uh, potential, it's a sort of low hanging fruit to think in terms of livelihoods um, regeneration and in terms of bi regional economic potential to try and increase regional resilience against climate re re disruptions and try to ensure that there are, there are co benefits in terms of development. A lot less, um, you know, uh, focus within the European Union, but also across the world, has gone into really looking into nature-based processes and complex regeneration processes to try and spur development that is inclusive, that looks at, you know, uh, development in the context of climate change, which is highly disruptive, and which also meets microeconomic targets, which you know states in the Indo-Pacific are very much um, trying to pursue. And then the last point that I'd like to focus on, which stands actually a bit in tension with the third, uh, with the second point, is actually um, a, a, something of, of, of geopolitical and geoeconomic um, you know, relevance, which is that the EU seeks to lessen dependency on China for critical materials, including rare earth, since China has based essentially its economic model um, on the vertical integration of uh, critical material supply chain for its rise to economic power. The result is essentially that China is now instrumental to the global mitigation efforts in the race to net zero and the development of renewable energy sources, which represents a geopolitical dilemma for Europe, because on the one hand, as Europe you know, enters its own transition and relies on China, it inflates China's balance of trade and sustains an economic rise of power of a systemic rival. So it's obviously logical that the EU is seeking to diversify its supply chains on critical materials, not just from an exploration perspective, but also um, from an industrial ecosystem perspective. And it needs to strengthen a geoeconomic balance of power and ensure the resilience of actors in the Indo-Pacific. It's important for Europe to help diversify economic ecosystems related to material and technologies um, associated with raw materials um, and associated to the transition, which China essentially currently dominates. And we know, and we can see it from this particular map, which comes from the International Institute for Sustainable Development, that the Indo-Pacific is replete with critical materials necessary for the transition, but we also know that the industrial and energy ecosystems associated with raw materials endowments is actually mostly absent and it needs to be developed. It's currently dominated in terms of export by Australia. There are a number of states in between China and Australia that need to strengthen their economic um, and industrial approaches to um, the transition. And um, importantly, what we need to notice, and it's in relation with the map just before, the endowment in raw materials is in tension with the global regeneration priority areas. Therefore, it calls essentially for um, an approach, which is, uh, especially by European actors, which is strategic, which is nimble, but which is also framed within an ecological mindset. A lot of the geopolitical heavyweights are currently rushing to gain access to these materials, but they're doing so in a way that perpetuates environmental damage, social marginalization, and conflict, as well as macroeconomic underdevelopment, because the extraction of raw materials is actually one of the least um, lucrative uh, you know, part of the value chain and needs to be associated with much more of an integrated approach towards value chain development. 
So Europe actually needs to approach Indo-Pacific actors with a proposition that is based on an ecological, social, governance, and geoeconomic understanding of the potential of the region within the, uh, the climate transition. So that means having a strategy on critical materials, which is about um, you know, diversifying access to critical materials for European actors, but it needs to be complemented by technological innovation on recycling and circularity of economy in Europe and in the partner regions, including the Indo-Pacific region, in order to switch away from extractive approaches and dependency relationships over time. It needs an attention of supply, on supply chain development and investment that puts an onus on social and environmental objectives and therefore heavily combines industrial and economic approaches with work on governance and socioeconomic redistribution. Um, there is a need to study how to create an integrated value chain approach to strengthen interdependencies and resilience amongst Indo-Pacific actors. And there is a need to involve private sector actors in adaptation investment conversations and find ways to really incubate regenerative business practices, not just sustainable. We need to move on to that next level of conversation. So in short, the EU must essentially place itself as a supporter and an enabler of regional resilience at ecological and economic levels. This is actually a strong opportunity for the EU to invest in climate diplomacy in this direction, particularly in the next few years with the combined benefits of strengthening European climate diplomatic leadership, mitigation and adaptation, and resilience of the Indo-Pacific in the face of geopolitical tensions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, and I think the angle that you're taking uh, is definitely very helpful in helping us understand that there's more to the debate on climate change than just decarbonization. And I think that is uh, often overlooked in, in the debates that we're having uh, and in many of the conversations, but we'll get back to that very soon. Um, here, the floor is yours. And in case I, um, in case you can't hear me properly, I'll sometimes switch off the video. My internet connection in the United States is not very good today, so uh, just bear with me a little bit. Me here, please. All right. I, I, I hope everyone can can hear me well enough. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of talk about uh, um, about this obviously from an Indian perspective, but try and make it as as general as possible. Um, and I'm going to try and essentially hit three points. First where does climate change figure in the view of countries like India um, in their view of strategic autonomy and in economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific? Second, where does what are the implications of that for our view of how the Indo-Pacific is changing over the next uh, five to seven years? And finally, uh, what therefore may be the convergences and divergences between our views and that of the European Union, and what are the ways in which we can maybe find uh, uh, partnerships uh, uh, going forward. So on the first, I think in many countries in the Indo-Pacific, and particularly in India, there is definitely a belief that our current development model is running out of gas, both you know, literally and figuratively. And, and, and for us, there's a clear link between um, new growth frontiers between the creation of strategic autonomy, essentially freedom from dependent supply chains, and investment in our green transitions. So in particular, we hope in India, as do many other countries in our neighborhood, that commitment to the green transition domestically will allow us to jump up the value chain. It will allow us to raise greater levels of infrastructure finance which you know we we're always worried about and finally i think to create new sectors that satisfy domestic and regional demand and obviously create jobs in the in in in, in that context and we're thinking in india for example about electric vehicles and batteries um as our you know some of our neighbors are thinking in terms of uh, solar uh, so large solar parks that that might be job intensive but various questions uh, uh, um that essentially Inter, intertwine domestically the climate change and the development and growth agenda. So we've created, I think, a fair narrative about how development, security, and climate change are very closely interlinked, at least domestically. Now, second point, how do we expand that into a, a coherent vision of how the Indo-Pacific will look 
going forward. Well, I think that, as I said, we hope that a green transition for our economies domestically and a shared green trans transition for many like-minded countries, developing economies in the Indo-Pacific will both reduce dependencies, which we see as increasing currently, and B, create new hubs for growth, right? So we are concerned essentially that the old development model, the resource-rich development model was creating um, a network of supply chains that was in the Indo-Pacific unipolar, hub and spoke, core and dependency, whatever you want to call it, that sort of model. We want to break out of that, right? And we believe that perhaps the green transition might aid us in certain ways in breaking out of that strategic dependence that we feel that we're growing into. So this we know requires the shifting of supply chains, which requires a lot of participation, a lot of conversations with the private sector, some of which can be quite painful. This we also know requires the creation of real and digital infrastructure in places that are currently infra deficient, right? Um, you know, some of our coasts uh, that are maybe ideal for trading within us, not so ideal for trading with China, but are therefore running short of uh, infrastructure at the moment. We also know, and I think we've come to this belief in the past year, year and a half, and when I say we, I mean not just the Indian establishment, but many similar uh, uh, countries, including Indonesia, including Bangladesh, we know that it means the creation of new institutions that can maybe manage the coordination of investment and of projects with a greater focus on sustainability, right? Now, that in itself, we hope the provision of alternatives for investments, for project finance, um, can perhaps re reduce dependence on big pools of tied capital, you know, such as to address the elephant in the room, the BRI, right? So we know you can't stop the BRI. We know that the BRI may be useful for many of us for, for individual projects, but um, we are concerned about its sustainability aspects and the strategic, uh, strategic aspects. The best way to fix that is the creation of alternatives. And it is possible, therefore, that um, we think, at least, that uh, the institutionalization uh, of, of, of new alternatives is something uh, that can take us forward, right? And finally, um, I think, where does Europe come into this? And uh, here we have to think about how there may be synergies in the approach of the EU and India. Um, Hang on, uh, may I just uh, interrupt to ask, everyone is frozen for me. Uh, is that just me? We can hear you. We can hear you just fine, it's perfect. It works. Yeah, just keep going. You're, you're perfectly, perfectly fine for us. Okay, great. So I, I, I think the, um, the, 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 the crucial question therefore, and to wrap up, is how are there synergies in this view of the Indo-Pacific that I think is slowly emerging out of the domestic imperatives of countries like India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and what the EU has to offer and the EU's own strategies, as well as those of member states, including uh, in particular, I think, France, on, um, you know, are, are there convergences, where are the uh, convergences and how can we operationalize them? And I think that um, the big win for us, at least in the, sh in the short to medium term, would be figuring out ways, figuring out norms, that can expedite financial flows into the green transition, right? And I, I think a lot of us are thinking in terms of private financial flows, uh, uh, not just public uh, financial flows. And this is, of course, where Europe excels. It's a, you know, if it's a superpower of any kind, it's a superpower of norms, right? And the real question for us is how to create a harmonization of those norms in such a way. And we believe the real problem with Europe in the past, with the European Union in the past, uh, three or four years in its green transition has been that it's been too inward focused. It's created a green taxonomy that doesn't take into account our strategic imperatives, our domestic imperatives. It's thinking in terms of a carbon, a carbon border adjustment mechanism that again, you know, kind of cuts off this uh, 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 entire green transition, the entire strategic reason for the green transition in places like the Indo-Pacific. Um, the real question for us therefore is how to green our strategic partnership and make sure that we are talking to each other when we are creating our own domestic green transitions and how to together create an institutionalization for this cooperation that can be inclusive 
um, that can have obviously India and the EU, but also bring in existing, our existing partners in the region, Vietnam, Bangladesh, et cetera, and ASEAN. And I think that uh, there's a certain amount of outwardness to our domestic green transitions that we have to think about. And if we are going to be trying to incorporate uh, uh, the geostrategic idea into our development narratives and vice versa, um, we have to start talking to each other about our green transitions at a much earlier stage uh, than we are currently doing. Thank you very much, Mihir. I think that's a, that was a, a good plea, and I will get back to you on kind of the EU's current initiatives on the Global Gateway providing financing for infrastructure, but we can talk about that, I think, in the discussion round. I would like to hand the floor over to Byford now. Yeah, thanks, Yanka, and thanks for having me on this, on this excellent panel. So, uh, yeah, so I'm here to talk about a bit more from the, the China perspective, but I also want to put it in a broader context of the Indo-Pacific region. So I'll first talk about kind of EU's diplomacy into the Indo-Pacific region and how that has impacted China's climate policies. Uh, and then secondly, um, what are the priorities areas that EU can focus on in this approach in, in the Pacific that would help accelerate green transition in China. So firstly, um, on current like diplomacy uh, approach and how that has impacted China. So we can see that in last year, one of the more significant climate policies from China is, is pledged to end uh, the construction of coal power plants overseas. And we should not forget that that followed um, the announcement, similar announcement by South Korea and Japan to do the same earlier in the year, and also from the G7. So, um, so obviously we couldn't, um, um, you know, make a direct link to that. But I'm sh surely that has uh, accelerated China's uh, decisions on the matter, and obviously the EU has played a role in, in, in strengthening, say, the, the Green Alliance with Japan, and also the diplomacy into South Korea and others in the region. And China's position has been has also been made more untenable after recipient of some of the Chinese coal finance in the region, like Indonesia, Vietnam, and Pakistan have um, announced policies that would scale down the coal development in the region. So just thinking about um, how, how EU diplomacy could play a role in the countries uh, in China's neighborhood and how that would have an impact on China's policy. And how could we replicate similar dynamics to move China's domestic coal policy, which is still at the moment uh, what they haven't committed to, to a face down of coal uh, until uh, from the beginning of 2026. So, so that's, that's, that's one area I would like to highlight. And then also going back to uh, the outcomes at COP. So, so the, a lot of focus has been on China's uh, action to, to kind of water down the language towards the, the end. But, but if we look at the, the overall, like there are some, actually some tiny steps from uh, on China's position. Um, China and alongside with all other countries have signed on to the Glasgow Climate Pact which says that all countries should revisit and strengthen their 2030 climate targets uh, by the end of 2022 uh, in order to align themselves with the 1.5 target. So, um, so, so I think the question on that is what, what does that mean for the EU? Uh, what, what does the EU need to do on its own and also engage partners in the Indo-Pacific region to facilitate ambition raising for next year and how that would have an impact on China. And also, I think that also speaks to the fact that this is important because it it's also protects the kind of integrity of the entire UN process because come, comes next year, if we, if none of the countries uh, would have bring forward more ambition than, 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 than that integrity itself would be in, in jeopardy or in serious question. So I think that is the, that is the second one I would like to highlight. And then thirdly, I think there are also some, some dynamics uh, around the COP26 outcome that we should pay attention to. And the first one is on coal. So coal has, has gained a lot of attention at COP, not least because of the, the final diplomacy, uh, uh, the diplomacy on coal and the final moments at COP, but also the fact that a lot of countries have signed up to um, uh, statements that uh, committed themselves to phase out coal or end coal, new coal construction. Uh, during the summit. Um, 
And we also see that actually coal uh, and getting countries to end the use of coal is highlighted as a major issue uh, in the in both the, the, the EU um, in the Pacific strategy, but also the French EU Pacific uh, in the Pacific strategy. So, uh, and we also look at the numbers: seventy percent of the global coal pipeline is located in just four countries in the in the Indo Pacific region. So that's China, India, Vietnam, uh, and Indonesia. So. And if we look at the outcomes at COP, both Vietnam and Indonesia have signed up to uh, the so-called coal to clean statement, which they have committed themselves to phase out coal in the 2040s uh, for Indonesia with, with additional on, on support from uh, other countries. For, but for Vietnam, they have also committed to end coal, new, the new uh, built out of coal. So, so that could potentially potentially change China's calculus on domestic coal, for example. So I think next year, I think the, the focus on this region will be to think about in terms of these major coal users, how do we get to move them a little bit forward in their position and how that might play into China's thinking on their coal policies. Um, and then finally, on the kind of COP dynamics, um, the other thing I would like to highlight is what Olivia has already said on the vulnerable uh, countries and the small island states. So if we look at some of the negotiating blocks in the uh, UN uh, climate process, so there is a block called AOSIS, which is the Alliance on Small Island States, and there are 29 countries in there, and 20 of them are in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and they have uh, historically played an instrumental role in raising the ambition of the entire uh, UNFCCC process, not least introducing or partly responsible for introducing the 1.5 target into the process. So, so they're a key group. Um, but if we look at the, the response to the overall COP outcome, obviously there were some disappointment around uh, what China and India perceived to be watering down the coal language in the end. But the majority of the disappointment is actually directed towards, as Olivia has pointed out, the underwhelming loss and damage um, and the adaptation outcomes there. So I think the question for us would be like how um, next year, like the finance negotiation for adaptation loss and damage, um, how, how that would play out because that would be key in playing into the mitigation conversation. Like Olivia said, like mitigation now depends on adaptation and, and loss and damage. And, and also the, import, the importance of meeting those pledges is, is also that we need to rebuild trust of the developing countries and vulnerable countries and build the momentum for greater ambition on coal and on climate targets by other major emitters, including uh, China. So, um, well, I do have some thoughts on kind of what the EU uh, should prioritize on, but I can save that for the Q&A because I think my seven minutes are up. Well, why don't we start with that then right away for the discussion? <laughs> what should the EU prioritize, Byford? Go ahead. Um, yeah, sure, I can, I can also do that. So. Um, so on that, I think there are, there are a couple of things. I think the first one is is um, on e, like EU-China like cooperation and also broader kind of EU Indo-Pacific cooperation. I think um, like standards um, for the clean economy would, would definitely play a, a great big role. Like the EU, like the, China is, is keen to strengthen cooperation in this area, as they have said repeatedly. Um, and at the moment, the EU and China are already cooperating on sustainable finance. Um, uh, standards. So whether there's room for more cooperation in the in the green infrastructure uh, space um, and also methane uh, and green trade is, is something to be to be seen. Uh, and and the EU should also ensure the the integrity um, of the green deal by safeguarding the social and environmental credentials of green technologies supply chains. So such as concerns with human rights issues in supply chain and. That, that that this this will need to be actions on you know carbon standards and human rights protection in product requirements on technology that are critical for the green transition, which the EU has already started to do on the proposed due diligence legislation and also the upcoming batteries uh, regulation. Um, so so I think this is a space that the US already playing in. Um, and then um, secondly, I think. Um, on climate risk and climate security. So in the Indo-Pacific strategy, the EU has set the importance of uh, strengthening prevention and rapid response to natural disasters. So I think that is absolutely right and also speaks to the, the kind of adaptation question that we, we just touched on. But I think it's, it's also 
there's also a need to, to think about the broader kind of security implication of climate change in the region and how the EU can, um, can play a role in, in, in facilitating some of those discussions with Indo-Pacific partners, including China, because China is more likely to agree on rapid decarbonization if, it's be if it better understands the risk to its interests um, uh, from uncontrolled climate change. So, um, so I think, yeah, so the climate risk uh, and security discussion, and, and there's already some, some efforts by, by EU, which was started by Germany last year, and um, which was also taken forward by Ireland and Niger, actually just these couple of weeks, there was a resolution in the UN Security Council um, that was supposed to raise the, the level of climate security in the, in the uh, institution, but it was vetoed by uh, Russia and, and China has an abstain on the, on the vote. Uh, it was just yesterday. So I think the EU definitely can have a, a more prominent role to play with in relation on climate security and China and thinking about uh, shifting China's um, calculus. Thank you, Byford. And I think the kind of code word climate security prompted Olivia to immediately raise her hand. So I will bring her into the discussion and would then uh, go back to me here afterwards and Paolo with a couple of more questions. Olivia. Thank you so much, Yanka. I wholeheartedly support um, pretty much everything that Byford um, said. Indeed, the, the climate security perspective, I think, just needs to be reworked a little bit because we've tended to understand climate security as something which in the end is very, very defensive and retroactive. And I think by Ford, what you're saying is indeed, you know, looking into the future and really using climate modeling to understand exactly how climate disruptions will play out in the in, in the coming months, in the coming years not just from a, a national security perspective, but really understanding how it's going to change the dynamics within the region. And that's a much more complicated and complex exercise to do, which requires foresight, simulation, and scenario building. And one of the key things to understand in there is really how to harness essentially this notion of ecological diplomacy, working to rebuild ecological integrity at the heart of, you know, every single region across the planet. But as I tried to demonstrate in the in the presentation, the Indo-Pacific region very much stands out in terms of priority areas regarding, you know, the necessity for regeneration. And again, here, I want to sort of to me, in terms of priorities that the EU should pursue in the region, at the end of the day, it is about resilience and new forms of development in a climate disrupted world. And that comes from pursuing complex regeneration at ecosystems levels, which is really hard and requires a lot more research. But it is only by rebuilding ecological resilience that we can talk about human development and national and economic development in a climate disrupted world, whilst at the same time really sort of, you know, trying to think of how to uh, design development from a legal, institutional governance and economic perspective vastly differently. So some of the low hanging fruits regarding, you know, the EU's agency lie in how to harness research partnerships regarding what resilience really looks like and doing it from an interdisciplinary and multidimensional perspective, looking at, you know, biology, climate science, um, socioeconomic development, macroeconomics, um, political sciences, et cetera, et cetera, and institutional and legal development on the one hand. And then the other part is indeed, you know, knowing that there is a very strong push for how do we handle this question of access um, to critical materials and competition around the sort of transition models that each and every region of the world is heading towards. And the question for the EU becomes how to cooperate with actors in the Indo-Pacific, but also in Africa and Latin America, over how to usher transitions that support a somewhat environmentally friendly extraction of critical materials, knowing that there is necessarily going to be some environmental damage anyways, but do so in a way that can help, you know, like to do some research in terms of how do we mitigate the impacts of material extraction and how do we ensure that socioeconomic human resilience and therefore sort of national resilience stems essentially from transition modeling rather than you know transitions driving economic interests at the expense essentially of ecological human and national resilience over time so this is really something that if we it's it's a it's a flip in the in the sort of you know geopolitical mind frame that we need to pursue 
you, Olivia. Mihir, I would like to kind of push you a little bit on, uh, you were very, with a smile, saying that the EU is a bit inward looking and we're kind of friendlyly poking there at the, at the EU. But I do think that that's an important point that you're raising, basically saying, you know, what is the expectation level of the region? What is it that you've observed you doing? And in that case, I would particularly like to, to press you a bit on this Global Gateway Initiative that the EU has announced. Now, it sounds great, 300 billion over seven years. That's a lot of money putting on the table. Um, all of this, you know, has to deliver also on the Green Deal. So it has to be invested in sustainable green infrastructure projects, etc. Is there an expectation also from the EU India Connectivity Partnership that there's something coming out of this? You know, th there has to be something in it for the Indian economy as well. It's not just about kind of European companies now doing something like you, you don't want to create similar dependencies. So what exactly, how do you walk that fine line into attracting European investment, balancing things out, um, in, in working together with Europe, but kind of working towards the Indian interests as well? And how can they best be served in that sense? Um, I think one large part of that argument has already been won, whether in India or in Indonesia or in many other uh, um large emerging economies in, in, in the region, which is that there is a general understanding in the domestic political class that anything that raises our access to long-term infrastructure finance is in our interest, right? So uh, the case for sustainable finance for sustainable infrastructure does not need to be made, right? Now, um, the immediate question that we that you know we would have about gateway first gateway is a wonderful step forward it is a really uh, uh, important thing and something that i maybe if you'd asked me a year and a half ago i would have said uh, the eu would not have been able to get its act together to do on this time frame but it's happened and um the crucial question now is is that accessible is that accessible for companies that want to make that investment Will it be able, will it, will it receive some form of um, concessional regulatory space domestically in the European Union, finance that flows into a gateway related project? Uh, will we be able to say immediately that the countries that are receiving gateway finance are ones with transparent and harmonized enough regulations that the private sector will want to participate in, 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 in you know, blend their finance in with the public uh, money that's on the table? And all of this requires now quite a lot of capacity building and quite a lot of behind the scenes work um, that will need us uh, to go from country to country in the Indo-Pacific, ideally picking out perhaps those countries that are both infrastructure deficient and that are important to us from a geostrategic uh, uh, perspective and go to them and say, okay, what are, the, what are the ways in which your domestic regulations to attack, attract infrastructure can be harmonized with ours what are the ways in which your development banks can speak to our private sector in a more uh, you know, uniform and accessible manner? Basically, we need this to become frictionless, right? And once the European Union makes it frictionless, then perhaps because the EU can demonstrate leadership in this, uh, we can take advantage of the existing EU-Japan partnership on green infrastructure, you know, because of course Japan is, is a giant financer of quality infrastructure in the region, bring them in, and then eventually maybe God knows the Americans will wake up and figure out something, right? Uh, but essentially, uh, the idea is uh, make it uh, smooth, make it flexible, adapt it to local considerations, make sure that, third, make sure that domestic regulations give it some form of concessional, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 status, and fourth, then try and bring in the other partners so it's not a confusing mishmash of an Australian program, a European program, a Japanese program, but one window that looks at, at people, you know, that the countries can look at as an alternative to the BRI, a sustainable, greener, and more uh, autonomous uh, alternative to the BRI. Just to follow up really briefly on that, um, because I think it's always a problem, some, or it's sometimes a problem in understanding, who does Europe need to talk to on the Indian side? Who are the interlocutors that can move this forward on the inter Indian side? Um, who are the players that are most relevant on this? Just to kind of help us understand a little bit. Um, in India, as in many other countries in the Indo-Pacific, uh, when it comes to matters like this, which are, um, which are, let's say, beyond the capacity that exists in the traditional bureaucracy, you have to start at the top, get political buy-in, right? 
Um, so I, you know, I made the claim earlier that you know, a, a, the, the, after the last EU India summit, there was movement on both sides, right? So if you can get the EU uh, and, and leaders at the European Union level, leaders at the member state level, making the case, making a uniform and understandable case to their political counterparts at every point, that's when it So in India, get the prime minister's office inside, things, things happen, right? Ditto in Bangladesh, ditto, I mean, in, in, in many other countries in the region. It's a political conversation. It's not a bureaucratic conversation. I know this is hard, therefore, for Brussels in particular. Right? But it's a political conversation because you need political buy-in to make those uh, uh, regulatory changes to, to, to push the domestic private sector. Very good. I think this is, the, um, and this is a call for action also for the new German government because if it's a political conversation, then you can't avoid the member states. And I think that is really important to bring them in. Paolo, I would like to kind of return this to you. Uh, you've patiently waited and listened to what's been said, but you obviously have views on the global gateway as well. So uh, is the EU, because uh, Mir was saying, um, you know, if you had asked me a year and a half ago, I wouldn't have thought the EU would get its act together. I would be even harsher and say, if you'd asked me three months ago, I probably would not even bet my money on it that they would have done it. So um, now that we have it, and the EU has surprised us once again um, of its capacity to act on these issues, um, what, uh, how do you see how, how frictionless can this be? Um, how far advanced are we? And can we create this kind of multi-purpose tool that allows us to deliver on the green transition, but also on geopolitical? Yes, well, oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me as well? Good. Yes, well, no, no, you, I can hear you, but the question is pretty difficult. Um, well, it is, I would say, the good news in reply to, 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 to a comment from India is that it is a political construction at the end of the day. I mean, this was announced by the president. It takes the Team Europe, which is this idea of basically putting together resources at EU level, at member states level, try to pull them together and to, to leverage, I mean, to get the maximum basically out of what we do. Because it, it, at the end of the day, if you look at individual investments of member state and the EU in many regions of the world, and I think in part of Asia Pacific as well, is far from being negligible already now. The question is how visible we are and how much geostrategic we are. And I think all these links with a, somehow the, the master plan of our president. I mean, she uh, started by saying that uh, this commission should, uh, should be a geopolitical commission. Obviously, there were some reason, including COVID, which pushed us probably a little bit more inward looking that should have liked it to be when, when the commission, this commission started working. Uh, but I think we're little by little going back to, 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 to the original ambition. So let's say, for me, the global gateway, it's, it's a geopolitical, it's a political construction. Now, obviously, the good news is that all this is linked with sustainability. Uh, so theoretically, it, it sounds really, really perfect. Now, the real question here, how easy, I mean, how accessible, how snappy this is going to be? Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. I mean, obviously, it's still work in progress. So it's, it's, it's difficult to know. Let's say there is a big chunk of it I'll say roughly half, I think, which is going to be easy because this will be connected to indices, so to our uh, sustainable development uh, funds. I think we have 140 billion, if I'm not mistaken, over the seven year, which are year marked, 135 billion, which are year marked for the seven years. So it's a little bit less than half of a total uh, pot of money. This should be easily, uh, easily let's say, uh, disbursable and with known procedure. Same thing, I believe, uh, EIB money also relatively easy. So let's say, um, I don't think, oh, well, let's see, uh, it's going to be quite difficult to put this into a single window, which would be perfect, of course, but I don't think it's realistic because that will take so much time to have it up and running that we are already in the middle of the period. So I don't think it's, it's reasonable. Uh, but if we need to ensure co coherence and uh, to have, let's say, uh, making sure we have the same high standard, for instance, in environmental protection, but making a single window, it's, it's probably a bit too much. Uh, let's say it's going to take too long. I mean, I heard enough critics on us not being very fast, and that is true, but that's how we are. Uh, we need to, to gather consensus very often on this kind of thing. So it's going to take 
to take time, but part of it is already disbursable today, basically. And I very much like the idea of trying to put together uh, not only EU, but also uh, donors in the region. Uh, Japan was mentioned. I think Korea is becoming a, a sizable donor. Well, ideally even China, but I mean, that's probably more of a distant dream uh, because if it's already quite difficult within the EU to, to put all this together, uh, imagine having a single window in the Indo-Pacific you support. I mean, uh, ideally perfect, but probably uh, not easy to realize in, in a reasonable time frame. Yeah, I think that's one of the issues that, that we're facing at the moment, that actually money is not the problem. The money is there for all of these transitions. It's just kind of distributed in a way that makes it difficult to use it in the fashion that is uh, that that would be most desirable to tackling the big challenge, which is climate change. And it is kind of conditioned upon geopolitical factors that just make that really harder. But I think that um, you, you're right. I think the Global Gateway is, is a first step um, and will need uh, the coordination and cooperation of other partners to just kind of work towards this. There is a question in the chat by my colleague Frederic Gras on the question of kind of the dialogue with China, um, that the how does one negotiate the reduction of um, the production when the EU is, is kind of still highly dependent on China for critical materials required by the transition? So the big question is, do we actually still have any kind of influence on where China is going in its green transition? Or is this something where, and I would kick that to Byford first, maybe that question, is it something where we should just give it up and should just say, we're not going to negotiate with China how they're going to solve the domestic solution anymore, the, the domestic transition anymore. They are transitioning. They're just, let's just forget about this, that we can do around that and do not condition anything anymore on what is happening in China. Is that a sensible approach? Or does that just take us to a line where we're saying, well, but they need to move faster and we still need to do whatever we can to make that happen? Yeah, I think on, your, on the last part of your question, so the answer is, is obviously like China is the biggest emitter, more than a quarter of the emissions and half the coal pipeline is in China. So if China doesn't, I mean, the problem with China is that it's, it's not that it, it's not moving, it's just not moving fast enough for us to be living in a safe climate. So I think that is the distinction that we have to make. Uh, and, then, and then to answer that question, like how do we move China then, then, um, well, like, like I said, I think diplomacy can certainly play a role in the region, like looking back at what has happened in the last two years in, in, in terms of getting China to end funding uh, on uh, coal-fired power plants overseas. Like, like, it's not only diplomacy, I mean, campaign groups in, in the regions that I, I mentioned, like Indonesia, Pakistan, uh, Vietnam, they have also played a role. So, so the EU can think about how they can support like transition there through well either civil society support or um or, or diplomacy like that there are different ways to 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 do that um but then looking back at, at china um i mean the re the main reason that it's not moving fast enough is because of uh i mean similar challenges being faced in any region like vested interest dependency uh locking in of the energy system uh, inefficient pricing mechanism. So, so those are all the issues that we will have to, well, in one way or another, support China to move on in order to, to move China faster on the uh, climate question. And I, I do believe that despite uh, well, the tensions that, that are there, there are a lot of uh, learnings from the EU regarding transitioning some of the, the, the coal-reliant region, especially in, in, in Eastern Europe um, in these days. I think there's a lot of experience, and also from Germany, there's a, a lot of experience that uh, EU, what well, China can can learn uh, from, from Europe in terms of how do we transition an uh, um, economy in the region that is dependent on coal into renewables without the worst of social economic impacts in the region. So I think that that's something that you can certainly play a role. And then going back to the kind of critical raw materials discussion. So, I mean, the EU is not all dependent on China. That Like EU is a leader in green hydrogen. So the EU can certainly double down on, on that uh, and building out the, the infrastructure and the research. And then on the critical raw material question, just one final point to complement what Olivia has already said, I think. Um, there's also an element of 
innovation in the technology, um, say for in the case of batteries. So uh, one Chinese manufacturer has already developed like a sodium based battery, which doesn't require lithium, which is obviously one of the, the, the materials that is needed uh, and is sought after. So I think the innovation in addition to you know, recycling and diversifying can also play a role in the critical raw material discussion. And Olivia, I'll obviously bring you in on the critical materials as well in a minute, but I do want to ask me here quickly on uh, the question of um, how is the how is the relationship with regard to China and the perception of dependency is also changing in India? Because you've hinted at it in your initial remarks, but I think just kind of laying out how this is changing and how this is something that is maybe simultaneously changing in Europe and in India, where there was a similar awakening, I would say, in Europe in terms of how dependent are we in certain critical sectors? How are we not overhyping this, but how are we not underestimating how important some of these dependencies are? Where is the debate there in that regard at the moment with regard to critical materials in, in the Indian conversation? And then I'll come to Olivia after that. Well, I think that um, essentially in, in India, the conversation about the dependence on China had you know three things sort of came together over the course of the year, about a year and a half. Um, and the first was an understanding that um, uh, several supply chains that were crucial for our future transition were already either dependent in, uh, dependent on, or dominated by, or would soon be dominated by, uh, um, uh, you know, producers in China. Um, I think the second thing was that there was actually, in our case, a direct military confrontation in which people died, right, and uh, which um, actually made a sense in which, okay. This is not a relationship that maybe we can uh, depend upon um, to the extent that uh, business as usual would, you know, would allow us to depend on it. And 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 finally, I think um, there was an understanding that grew in our private sector as well as in the you know the broader, broader private sector that invests in the Indo-Pacific that um, it had become dangerous for them financially and from their their you know their own risk management perspective to have undiversified supply chains. And that's an, that's an idea that eventually became quite clear, essentially in the, in the early months of the pandemic. Um, and so you have this sort of combination of, of, of the, you know, the development and growth people, the private sector and the security people all simultaneously thinking about the China problem, you know, at the same time for a few months last year. And that shifted the uh, the conversation in India. And that shift, and I think that, that, that shifting the conversation in, in several other parts um, of the world as well, so of, of, of this region as well. So the essential idea here being that we know, and we're already late, late to the party, we know that in India, for example, we don't want to increase our own domestic production of rare earths. We know where it is. It's in our biodiversity hotspots, right? This is really not a choice we want to be forced into, right? Um, but if there are ways in which we can create an alternative and be part of an alternative supply chain for rare earths, that goes through like-minded countries in which the investment is made by uh, uh, you know, private sector actors that we feel are not necessarily controlled by Beijing, we would buy into that in whatever way we can. I think that, that's essentially what, we, what we're looking at. It's like, why is nobody else trying to create a supply chain that we can be part of? That's, I think, our point. Thank you, Mihir. And uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Thank you, Mihir. Yanke, I think you gave me the floor, didn't you? <clears throat> I think that's a great point, Olivia. Why is no one creating a supply chain that we want to be part of? That is a good. Um, I did. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm sorry. The, the connection was just a bit, um, a bit assembly. Um, I think the critical material question is really, really complicated. Um, and I think this is what Frederick's question was hinting towards. Um, so for the longest time, uh, the US and the EU were quite satisfied with outsourcing the environmental destruction that comes with mineral extraction to China. And we all know what happened in Mongolia, where rare earth extraction particularly has taken place. It's, um, it's, a, it's a lot of environmental, social, and political issues that came out of that with fairly irreversible types of pollution that happened there. 
And for a long time, as a result of, you know, the sort of liberal mind frame and this notion of, you know, the more we, uh, you know, work with China and create those economic interdependencies, there was this assumption, which, uh, you know, um, Chancellor Merkel also sort of, you know, came back upon that China would essentially open up over time. So there was a bet essentially, you know, with the critical material question and others that it would lead essentially to a more stable type of global economic ec ecosystem. That didn't happen. Um, and the, the assumption is now sort of, you know, has led the European Union, but others as well in the globe, including the US in a situation where, as I said, you know, it's dependent on a systemic rival, which um, is also quite um, strong on human rights abuses um, and, uh, and, and upending essentially the multilateral system. So the question then becomes, how does the European Union or other actors really sort of, you know, manage um, the growth, the economic growth of a, of a systemic rival? Um, which is using that growth essentially to change um, the international and multilateral system and some of its fundamental, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, values within it. Um, so as part of that, the, 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 there is a, a revisit essentially of the, of the critical material question and therefore it sort of, you know, dives into a lot of uh, other types of discussion. So one is, as Byford was saying, the innovation aspect. How do we shift away from certain materials to still spur towards, you know, like the decarbonization and digital uh, transitions in a way that supports economic growth in your in the European Union and elsewhere? The timeline, and I see that Frederick was asking this question for this type of innovation is unclear. There are lots of, you know, uh, research, for example, in the in the use of algae as well to replace lithium. Um, but this is uh, not sort of leading to anything substantial and we're working a lot more on energy efficiency of batteries um, and other types of technologies and, and still therefore sort of, you know, very much relying on rare earth, lithium, copper, cobalt, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not shifting away from the extractivist um, dimension. So we know already that even though there is quite an attention to this conversation, the research breakthroughs that we would need would take a long time. Um, so we, it, it brings us to this question of how do we manage the geopolitical dimension and therefore also the ecological dimension of relying on those rare earth. And so then, you know, it's a, it's another conversation of saying, so where, where do we invest? Um, because, you know, ecologists and climate scientists are also telling us that there are some plant, some parts of the planet that we should not touch, even if they contain critical materials. So where can, uh, exploration and extraction concentrate with the least possible damage in geopolitical, geoeconomic, and ecological terms. And this is a really, really complicated discussion to have, but it's the one conversation where if we dare strongly enough, I think, in the European Union to look at the complexity of this question rather than try and shy away from it or ignore um, you know, the larger complexity, then we can find um, a way to indeed sort of cooperate with partners in the Indo-Pacific, in Africa, and in Latin America that really uses those questions as a way to spur conversations about what the transition should be about, because it's not just about energy substitution. It's about leveling power relationships. It's about establishing a new type of geoeconomic balance of power. It's about delivering on inclusive growth, if growth there needs to be, and in those regions, growth needs to be there, but it also needs to potentially be questioned in, in, in economies that are a lot more advanced and sort of focused on consumerism um, and, and productivism ad vitam aeternam to, you know, a, a, in a way that is ecologically unsound. And all of those questions taken together give us essentially, you know, some pathways towards how to cooperate with the partners that need to deliver on macroeconomic growth, inclusive growth, um, climate resilient development, um, and, um, and adaptation. And all of these different themes are actually sort of connected together and the EU needs to deliver in terms of political dialogue, development programming, um, industrial research, and um, geoeconomic partnerships in a way that strengthens, once again, resilience, inclusive development, 
and stability. And this part is really important. Stability also understood in terms of conflict prevention and climate disruption prevention as much as possible. Paolo, is this incorporated in the EU's approach entirely already? Would you say that this is at the heart of what we're already doing? Or is this something we say, well, actually, this is something that makes it really hard for us uh, at the moment because they're overlaying other interests, including business and trade interests, um, that may make this conversation a lot harder for the Europeans at the moment? Well, I would say at least we, we have in mind all these issues and we are trying to tackle them. Now, I think Olivia is right in a way that there, there, there is a big tension no, between uh, mitigation, let's say, on one side, or decarbonization, protection of the economy somehow, conservation, environmental concerns, growth in general. So yes, there is a lot of tension among those things. So, well, I think we somehow we have to prioritize. I mean, uh, we have been talking in the last uh, few years like climate change being the threat of century. So I think we have been putting a lot of priority there, but I think we have been trying to look this in, into in, in a, as comprehensive way as possible. In the sense, for instance, uh, well, for us, it was quite clear uh, we need to decarbonize, but we need to do it in a way which is not uh, negative of the economy and even less that is not negative for the society. I mean, especially for a vulnerable part of the population. So that's, let's say, the inward look inside that some people would say. Conservation, same story. I mean, we have a clear nexus, for instance, biodiversity climate, which is already there. Is it enough? Probably not. I think Olivia is right when she says that we need to look more, more into nature-based solution. Uh, it's true, but, but it's there. I mean, it's something we, we are already working on. Uh, same for research. I mean, if you look at Fifth of 55, already now, but even more with Fifth of 55 and the New Horizon project, we, we are betting also on technology. Let's say we have a different approach, if you say compared to US, where uh, the, let's say, there is, so much open to technology we are not already there. We try not to take into account of technology we are not there when we make pledges, let's say. We, we try to make our impact assessment in a way which is uh, with existing technologies, let's say. Of course, we, but, but it doesn't mean we are sleeping. Uh, we, we try also to, to try and, and, and invest a lot in there. So uh, I think globally, yes, we are aware of issues. Same thing if you look at access to, 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 to critical material, to rare earth, et cetera. In general, the extractivist model, uh, we are, there are a couple of ways we are trying to tackle it. I think the first is the, what you can call free R or four R. So reduce, reuse, I mean, recycle. It's an important part of our strategy. Uh, if you look, for instance, on reparability, for me, it's one of the key issues where uh, well, you can reduce quite considerably the, the, the amount of material you are using. It's just an example, but I think all the effort also decarbonizing the, the economy will play, I think, a positive role also on using less resources, because if you produce your steel with hydrogen instead of coal, not only you pollute less, but you, you, you don't have to mine it, basically. So there is a big difference. Um, we, we try to do it in the most comprehensive and holistic way as possible. Uh, I, I'm sure we were missing bits and pieces here and there, and uh, more than happy to always listen to, to civil society to try to do better. Uh, but we have it very clearly in mind. It's not only an obsession about, about mitigation, let's say. I would like to throw, before we have to wrap things up, I would like to throw one more kind of broader topic to this panel, and that is the technology question that Byford has hinted on a little bit, um, but I think that is really important to talk about. Each of you has actually talked about technology a little bit, and the question of, you know, it is being like, thought as one of the saviors in this. Um, we were thinking about kind of innovating ourselves out of the problem. Um, we are investing a lot of uh, in, in technology. The one question that kind of um, is, is always on my mind is, A, as you said, Byford, um, you know, the, the question of sodium-based batteries, that innovation is coming from China, right? Um, so we're not talking about innovation that is taking place outside of China in these areas. So where are our key strengths in this regard? Where are the innovation areas where you would say we are actually really in the lead um, in on the European side 
or uh, in other Indo-Pacific countries, not China, um, in, in terms of that kind of geopolitical battle that we're having. And the second element to this is, is a question that kind of is bothering me for, for um, months now. And that's the question of how can we sustain um, technological leadership in areas where China is now after um, massive decarbonization pledges um, is kind of moving into. So not just the solar industry, but particularly the wind industry or nuclear technology that will be kind of a, a, an important part of China's um, outward financing and investment strategy. Um, and that will be really important for the Indo-Pacific region um, in supporting the green transition in these countries. To just flag a little example, um, if we're thinking about kind of um, the energy um, production in the Maldives, um, that was all focused on, on diesel generators. Um, and now China is coming, coming forward with a lot of solar pledges there and, and kind of trying to invest in solar power. And Europe has not been able to do so because our financing instruments really can't accommodate political risk in, in the Pacific countries that are not as stable as we like them to be. So how do we deal with that in the future um, that we actually are able to have the technologies and the companies that can provide this technology um, to have our own energy security um, um, kind of factored in to this discussion. Because if Europe doesn't have any companies anymore that can produce solar panels or wind turbines, then we become dependent in a whole different array. Let's put it like that. Um, so maybe let's just kind of throw this to this round to the panel um, and, um, and start with, I, I think I'll start with Byford on this one. Yeah, so I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, on the <clears throat> innovation question, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't speak for, for Europe, but I think a lot of innovation, like, like I said, is coming from uh, uh, China, especially on the battery front. So I think there's uh, definitely more room to, for, for the EU to, to play a role in more R&D. But as I said, the, the Europe, in terms of uh, hydrogen technology and the, the, the kind of electrolyzers technology that is more geared towards renewable energy, EU has, a leading role in the in the R and D space, so to speak. So I think that that is something that the EU can lead on. But obviously, we have to re, uh, you know recognize the limitation of of green hydrogen. It couldn't yeah it couldn't meet all the European energy needs. Um, so I think that's that's a question to to think about. Uh, and then in terms of the the, the wind solar industry um, question, so. So I think we we would also have to put it in the context of kind of what China. Well, China has only very recently pledged that it's going to ramp up support for renewable energy, uh, well, as part of the its pledge to to end coal support overseas. So, for all these talks with kind of green BRI, like this is the, the most, the major or highest uh, political pledge to 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 ramp up support for renewables in third countries. So, but I think a lot of that remains to be seen. Like most recently, we have seen. Uh, in the China-Africa summit towards the end of last month, there were a lot of support being thrown uh, financially and on projects. So there were a lot of commitments on projects. I mean, there were a lot of analysis saying that China's commitment financially to, to Africa in, as part of the EU-China-Africa Africa, uh, summit has reduced. But if you count in um, the, the projects that were announced, but also the, the vaccines um, commitments and other commitments, like China has maintained its um, support in the region, and that includes like green and renewables energy. So I think um, what well, China is also finding is the right modalities to invest in renewables abroad. I mean, it has not traditionally been, uh, uh, a lot of the supplies have traditionally been going into traditional energy, like uh, gas and coal. So I think China is also exploring um, the modalities um, at the moment. So I I would like to see whether um, there, there's room for actually, for actually EU to engage China in this area, because China did uh, announce most recently that it's going to introduce a new uh, global development initiative, uh, which is more geared towards like sustainable development goals, which includes climate, but it has specifically said that China is open in this regard and would like to uh, work close, closely with the G20 and also with Europe uh, or the EU to, to work on this matter. So um, yeah, so I think that, that is more, more a question like on whether there is more room for, for China and EU to, to build out like high quality standards, at least agree on a set of standards and, and, and agreed on the rules of the roads to invest in this area. 
overseas. Thank you, Byford. Mir, how is the scene from the Indian perspective? Um, our technological competition with China on these fronts, uh, innovation capacity, um, and our ability to secure kind of energy security in the age of renewables. You're still muted, so we need to unmute you. There, are, there are a lot of points here, actually, and I'll try to run them through them as quickly as I can. Um, the first point is that. I think that one of the things that a lot of emerging economies in the region, including India, are fairly proud of is the fact that um, innovation, the, the, uh, you know, the dissemination of, and, and distribution uh, of, of innovation, of new innovations, isn't just about where it's created, but also about finding the processes that put it into place and you know, adapting your existing networks. And, you know, like for example, renewables are fine, but can you, how do you put renewables into the grid? How do you find the land for them? How do you uh, pay for, uh, you know, how do you create the financing systems around them, et cetera. And on, on, on a lot of those, I think that's also a form of innovation that some of us, it's a process innovation, not just you know, the product innovation that a lot of us are pretty good at. So India may not make uh, uh, you know, in as much of, um, the, the you know the, the photovoltaic uh, uh, um, supply chain as it wants, but it does have the lowest installed cost of large solar in the world because of the process innovation in, in how it, it puts those elements together. So I think there's there's a lot of hope that it's not just about the basic science. There's a lot of other stuff that involves getting those products to market, and 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 there the Indo-Pacific does have a, a comparative advantage. We are concerned now. This is a pretty big thing about. Um, and it's 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 a concern not just at what happens if it's if you're dependent on the on the research that's coming out of China and products that are uh, that are uh, that are coming out of China, but also but what happens if um, there are patents that are held in 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 you know in, in in the West, right? So there's a there's a fairly difficult conversation that we're going to have to have going forward about what is the link between IPR and the climate crisis, and it's one that's become very very sensitive because we're just emerging from a pandemic in which we've had a difficult conversation about IPR, right? About intellectual property rights. And it's something that I think we need to get ahead of. I've, I've written a column recently that saying that we need a COVAX for climate, put it, put it into place right now, start thinking about co-developing, co-financing a lot of these innovations in our countries right now, because we don't want to be in the position that we are with mRNA vaccines, for example, where you know one American company can basically block the uh, dissemination of mRNA technology effectively because of the contract it signed with its research partner, you know, in the U.S. government, right? So that that, that kind of situation is not something that we we, uh, we we need to be because we're on a timeline here with climate, and we need to be able to fix it. Uh, that's something that I think that a lot of us are concerned about. And finally, we're really, I, I, and, and this is something that I think I, I, I need to stress. We we're really not in this alone, right? So you mentioned, Yanka, the, the question about, um, you know, how do we get, you know, nuclear power, uh, you know, how do you get uh, stuff to the uh, countries like the Maldives, right? Uh, where maybe you can't, you don't have land for a giant solar plant. And um, Singapore is buying stuff, buying, buying, you know, uh, uh, Indonesia is buying uh, uh, nuclear reactors from South Korea, right? Now, um, that may have been a little difficult for some countries because you need to negotiate with the, with the Korean Exim Bank, et cetera, et cetera. Nuclear financing uh, uh, with some of the nuclear producers is, is part of the problem. There's been, a, there've been proposals on the table for a very long time on co-financing nuclear projects, right? Um, and that's something that we need to, uh, that's the kind of thing we need to take forward, right? If you have uh, a nuclear project in a country in the Indo-Pacific, in which it is being produced in country A, the um, uranium may come from country B, Australia, and the financing should be, com uh, should be coming from country C, as long as they meet the same sustainability and uh, uh, standards, you know, a shared set of values, right? And I think that's, that's what we have to work towards, co-financing a shared supply chain for, for a lot of these issues and shared innovation, a shared pool of innovation. Otherwise, we, yeah, we're stuck. Thank you, Mihir. Um, we only have five minutes left, so I, I will have to ask Olivia and Paolo to be really brief uh, in, in their remarks, but um, we're just going to have to take on some of the comments that have been raised before um, and to just kind of uh, wrap that together with what you had kind of, what you want to say. Um, 
I think the, the just to get a little footnote on this, the nuclear question um, and the nuclear financing question is going to become a bit of a nuclear issue um, in the European debate relatively soon with the new German government in place. So we'll see how that turns out. But with this, Olivia and Paolo for quick remarks as well. Well, the technological innovation aspect is a bit out of my comfort zone, but I was actually going to say that indeed, you know, there's quite a number of research and really good research about new forms of fusion in Europe, but obviously this is indeed becoming a bit of a, of a thorny issue. Um, but what strikes me in general is essentially that there are, there are many, many different research networks which are of incredibly high quality in Europe. And it's indeed, you know, a, a, a bit of a puzzle that there can be so much qualitative research networks that do not necessarily amount to technological breakthroughs or to you know technical amounts of research that can then be harnessed into cooperations with partners um, across the world. Um, but I'll mention a few things which I think sort of you know uh, deserve a bit more uh, sort of um, uh, attention in terms of um, innovation um, which don't necessarily have to do with technology, but rather with processes of private and public partnerships, for example, the incubation of regenerative, you know, business uh, models that are happening a little bit in Europe and which we need to sort of, you know, invest a lot more into and that needs to be exported as part of cooperation partnerships. There needs to be indeed, you know, a lot more research going into what a circular economy means. And we are sort of, you know, ground zero for this in a lot of ways. But on the technical aspect, what needs to deserve, what deserves a lot more attention is what recycling, recycling means specifically for, for very technical sectors. So if I look, for example, at uh, the end life cycle is of wind turbines, they're being crushed and recycled into you know, materials that we use for road coating. This is a very, very poor type of recycling because we're actually losing the atoms that are part and parcel of the wind turbines that should go back into another cycle of production afterwards. This is the type of thing that Europe has the ability now to sort of zero in onto and then to invest into in the future. I'll stop there because I know that we have you know, some more uh, uh, things to say, but there are, we need to think in terms of technological innovation and technical innovation as well as process innovation regarding the birth of new economies that are a lot more regenerative at scale. Thank you, Olivia. Paolo, you have the last word before we hand over to Gabriele Vicente after this. Yeah, thank you. And I have two minutes, I think. So let me try to be very concise. Now, just on a personal note, I have been working both in Japan and in Korea, and especially in Korea, where we're very jealous of their capacity of, let's say, market new technology. But at the same time, I remember the Korean being very jealous of how many Nobel Prize we are winning in Europe and how strong we are in basic research. So we, we need to explore this complement. And I mean, I, I, this is country I live in, but I know India is in a very similar situation as well. So we, we have a lot of complementarities and this is definitely something we should work more on. Um, we, we are trying. I mean, if you look at, at, at Horizon 2020, we well, in the Horizon Europe now, we have been trying to create joint research pools of company. Of course, it's always bottom up, so it's not something we create as, as a commission, but there has been a number of consortia with many countries, in, in, in particular in, in the Asia-Pacific region and go, going together with AU to do high-quality research in particular in the, in the area which are somehow related to, to green technology. So I think this is something we need to do more. Having said that, we are not so bad in Europe. I mean, if you look in renewable, we are at least in wind, we are still leading by far. Uh, if you look at the future, well, on hydrogen, I think we are also not far from leading. Um, carbon capture storage is also good technology where we are, we still have, I think, a, a technology advanced. So, Overall, and we are we have also new what we call industrial alliances. Now we have one on raw material, we have one on batteries. So we are moving into that direction as well. So it's clear a priority to somehow create some sort of industrial policy, which we didn't have for many years. And this these alliances are going into that direction. I think to to try to move the let's say re basic research excellence into something which percolates down to the market, basically. 
Thank you very much. And with this, we're coming to the end of an incredibly um, kind of fascinating conversation that was taking place mainly here on the panel because uh, I think our participants were just listening uh, to what you were having to having to share and having to say. Thank you very much to our fantastic panelists, Paolo Caridi, Olivia Lazart, Mihir Sharma, Byford Sang. Thank you for taking the time. I know this is a busy time at the moment, um, and December is always a nightmare in terms of engagement that one has. So really, really a big thank you from our side for taking the time. Thank you to the French Foreign Ministry for making all of this possible, uh, this whole conversation and this entire day of conversations. Um, and thank you, obviously, to the fantastic team at ECFR, namely Manisha Reuter, Frédéric Gras, Amanda Pope, that make this all possible behind the scenes and are not so visible um, at, this, at this very moment. We don't want to end without um, sending you like we don't want to send you into a what will hopefully be a delightful holiday break without um kind of a reflection and a remark from the actor that is going to be key um for uh the kind of european approach to the indo-pacific and uh that is the eu special envoy for the indo-pacific at the external action service gabriele vicente who has uh we're very grateful and honored that he has uh, has um, agreed to come and provide us with concluding remarks and maybe some additional food for thought um, well, there'll be plenty of food, food in the next few weeks, I think, for everyone, but food for thought for the holiday times um, and how Europe can position itself in the Indo-Pacific across all of the areas that we have discussed today. Thank you so much, Mr. Vicentin, for kind of closing us off today. Hello, Janka, and, and thanks to, to everybody for, uh, for having me here today. I have to say, it's uh, on one side, it's difficult uh, uh, to close without having attended the whole event. But on the other side, it's very easy because I can say whatever I want, and then there's no time for debate afterwards. So that puts me in a, in a fantastic, uh, uh, good, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a tactical position. And uh, it's the first time I do something like that, Janka, and I think it will be the uh, the, the 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 way I will do my interventions in the <laughs> in the public events. No, uh, but thank you very much for for having me in such a, in such a high level event uh, with key speakers. It's a, it's a great program, and I'm sure you went through all the various uh, strands uh, uh, of uh, of, uh, of uh, possible actions that the EU has put forward. Uh, I just heard the very last, uh, 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 let's say, uh, interesting remarks of my friend Paolo, uh, whom I already uh, met in, in, in private sessions. So basically nothing new uh, I heard from him. So, but uh, just things which make a lot of sense. Um, so uh, unless you have specific uh, items, Janka, I would maybe just give a little bit of uh, a taste of the overall philosophy of the of the EU engagement in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I will be brief. So if you want to, to come out with more specific questions, uh, uh, more than more than happy to, to, to take them on board. So uh, the, the European Union strategy on Indo-Pacific, um, maybe just a little bit of pedagogical uh, uh, lecturing um, is composed of two basic documents. So if you want to know in detail, you should read those. One is the Council Conclusions of April 2021. And another one is the joint communication between Commission and High Representative of September. And I insist it's not just a bureaucratic, uh, uh, let's say, remark, uh, because the uh, strategy for the Indo-Pacific is supported by all member states of the EU. So it's not just the ones who have a, a, an Indo-Pacific policy of their own but the Council conclusions on Indo-Pacific has been unanimously adopted by all member states. So this is an important uh, starting block. Then we have had the specification of the, of the strategy uh, in the joint communication of September. There you have the seven areas uh, for cooperation. I'm sure you went through that, so I, I, will, not, I will not go too much in detail. Uh, what I want to highlight is that the Indo-Pacific is already the center of gravity of the world. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, the place where 60% of the world GDP is created. It is the place of origin of 40% of the trade which goes to the, to the EU. Uh, it is the region where 2 million, I say 2 million EU citizens reside on EU soil. 
uh, normally around 8,000 troops are always stationed in the Indo-Pacific. And we always, of course, talk about French territory, but it is EU territory as well. Uh, in 10 years, within 10 years, 2.4 billion people <clears throat> will exit poverty and will join middle class. And 90% of these 2.4 billion will come from the Indo-Pacific region. So it's not now, it's all in the future will be even more the center of gravity of the world. And this poses also not only opportunities, but also risks uh, for the EU. Um, for the free and open access to the Indo-Pacific, access to the critical straits, um, the tensions which are geopolitical, the tensions on the border, the tensions of the, of the implementation of the, of, of the law of the seas, and so on and so forth. So this is why we have come out with a comprehensive strategy with the seven pillars, climate change, uh, econo economy, uh, defense, uh, ocean governance, uh, health, and so on. Uh, what the Indo-Pacific strategy does is not to change the policies of the EU or the relations that the EU enjoys with the partners of the region. So the Indo-Pacific strategy does not change the relation that the EU has with Japan or that the, relation, the, the relations that the EU has with India or with Indonesia or with Korea, name it. Uh, the strategy allows the EU to look from the same uh, strategic umbrella, the toolbox of policies that uh, it has at its disposal in the region. And this in a mutually reinforcing way. So when we talk about the importance of trade, well, we talk about the reinforcement of our maritime presence so that the, the access to the uh, see to the to the navigation routes remain remain uh, remain uh, accessible, um, or when we talk about connectivity and we link it to the to the green, uh, uh, to the climate change fight against climate change, then we see that the overall the, the new structures will have to be, uh, uh, if not uh, green, uh, they will have to be uh, uh, climate neutral, as we say. And I just heard. Uh, uh, your Indian uh, uh, interlocutor talking about nuclear. So that's that's something we should be borne in mind as well. So the Indo-Pacific strategy allows us, European Union, to look at ourselves as a, as a strategic uh, uh, player in the, in the region, not just a sectoral player on policy by policy, but a comprehensive player for the, for the, for the, for the region. Um, and this is the novelty. Uh, or by the way, in the way we look at each other. And of course, of course, uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy cannot be implemented only by the EU's institutions. We call it a Team Europe effort. Uh, this means that it can only be implemented in its entirety uh, with the support of the member states. So it is the commission, it is the EIS, but it is also all the member states. And this is why we have the march to all our uh, delegations in the area to come out with a list of priorities, country per country, uh, established in uh, uh, cooperation with the missions of the member states in each of the countries. So we are beginning now to receive these reports, and this will allow us to concretize and go forward with the actual implementation of the strategy, because I think that the main purpose of your meeting today is to operationalize this, this concept. I heard, I heard uh, some, some remarks on, on research and development, for example. Well, uh, you see in the, in the strategy, we talk about uh, 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 under the chapter uh, uh, that we, the, the, which talks about partnerships, we specify the importance of associating uh, the country, some countries of the region to our research uh, program to Horizon Europe. Uh, and not just on a project per project basis, but really uh, associating them to the EU programs uh, in, in terms of research and development. But the, go the same goes with, uh, with other strengths of, of, uh, of, possible, of possible cooperation. Um, so um, maybe we have five more minutes. I can maybe give you the floor for putting me a couple of questions. Just if you want, 
the motto uh, of our of our strategy, uh, and it's uh, journalistically usable. It is that we say uh, that we cooperate whenever possible, and we protect whenever necessary. Uh, and this gives the uh, idea of, of our approach. And uh, last, uh, uh, probably there's no need for me to say it, but I do it anyhow. Uh, our strategy is open, is open to all the partners who want to cooperate with us in the various strands that we set out. And our uh, uh, partners uh, are not, let's say, asked to choose between us or others, but it's simply they can choose to cooperate with us according to, to, our, to our strategy. So it's a strategy which is inclusive, not exclusive, and it's a, a way of opening up and not of closing. And I am happy also to say that uh, if you read the speech that uh, uh, the uh, State Secretary Blinken gave in Jakarta uh, yesterday, where he outlined the new US policy for the Indo-Pacific, well, he cited more than once the EU's strategy for Indo-Pacific, saying that uh, it was a sort of, let's say, inspiration, or that uh, the two strategies are very much uh, uh, aligned in terms of uh, uh, contents and, and, and aims. Uh, and this also shows how important uh, is the cooperation with uh, partners, which are not necessarily from the region, in order to make a difference in the region. Thank you very much for you. Um, so if you speak about Team Europe, then I immediately think about football. Um, and I think, you know, <laughs> Europe now has a team. Um, the captain is on board with all of this. There is a game plan. Um, the, Europe has entered the field. So what is our first move to score? Um, how do we get this ball rolling really quickly? Just in like maybe two sentences, what is the first thing that you need to do to keep this A on the agenda, the topic with all of the other stuff that's going on around Europe? Um, and how do you kind of actually move now, next step? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Yeah, I mean, I like, I like the, the image, but not completely because uh, the, 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 the football team always has to score against someone. And uh, it's, uh, it's not a value in itself. It's always a 1-0 or 2-0. So it means that someone is taking our goal. And this is not the aim. Our aim is to cooperate, not to score goals against someone else. Uh, so let's say that the, the key for us is, for example, to start already uh, implementing the connectivity to the global gateways. We have come out with uh, uh, a blending which shows the European way to connectivity, which is based on private public uh, uh, money, but also with the involvement of financial institutions. But above all, our grants and loans uh, will be given uh, on the basis of sound business plans and above all on the financial feasibility of the project, which means that the beneficiary or the indebted part will be able to uh, uh, repay the debt and consider this as a vehicle for development, not for struggling, if you, if you see. So it's, uh, that's for me is the backbone of our presence uh, worldwide, but in the Indo-Pacific as well. And uh, on, on that, I think uh, uh, it will be, it will be the, the credibility of the EU will be tested to work with the member states, with the partners in the region, and in joining forces with, with, other, with other big partners who can be donors like the United States or like Japan or, or these uh, this like-minded countries. Thank you very much, Gabriele Vicente. We know that you have a very busy schedule ahead, so we don't want to keep you longer. And we are ending a, a long day of discussions on the Indo-Pacific uh, with, with your remarks. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you very much to all of our speakers throughout this entire day that have contributed. Thank you to all of the participants that have spent their day with us uh, so far in all sorts of time zones, in all sorts of places around Europe, around the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, I'm even joining from Washington here. So I think we had a, a great conversation all day. Um, it has been um, a fascinating endeavor.
Thank you very much to our colleagues from the French Foreign Ministry, my colleagues at ECFR. Um, I wish all of you um, a delightful and a peaceful and a slightly calm and reflective holiday season ahead. Um, I hope that all of you get a little bit of a year-end break because this year was rough. Um, it was wild. And I think the next year is going to have a lot in stock for EU and the Indo-Pacific region. So we better get a little bit of a rest so that we can fully move in January in the spirit that Camille Vicente has laid out for us, kind of a friendship game that we're playing um, with the others to kind of move everyone forward and get fit for the 21st century and the, the needs of it. Thank you all very, very much um, and have a wonderful day.